Very, very, very welcome to Imperial College. My name is Tilly Collins and I'm one of the fellows of the Society and work in the Centre for Environmental Policy here. But I just wanted to welcome you and welcome the Royal Entomological Society today. And I hope you enjoy your afternoon. All over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Tilly. And uh, before I continue, I'd just like to say thank you so much to Imperial College for uh, hosting us today. Uh, hugely appreciated. Uh, so, a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, my name's Jane Hill. I'm from the University of York, and I'm the current president of the Royal Entomological Society. And it's really wonderful to see so many people uh, here today for the RES Feral Lecture 2024. Um, many of you will be no doubt going on to the Verrill Supper this evening, organised by the Entomological Club. And so I'm really looking forward to the discussions there and uh, having a fun afternoon uh, now and, and in the evening ahead. Um, so before I come to introduce this year's uh, wonderful speaker, uh, there's a few housekeeping points and also some RES announcements. Uh, so, uh, first of all, please familiarise yourself with your nearest fire exit, uh, which is at the front here and also at the back. And there are no fire drills uh, planned this evening, so if we hear an alarm, then please make your way out of the building by the nearest fire exit. Um, today's lecture's been recorded, and it'll be available in due course on the RES YouTube channel. Uh, so... I'd just like to tell you about some exciting RES activities that are ongoing over the next couple of months. Um, just going to pick out a few to highlight uh, before I go on to introduce Rebecca. Um, if you'd like any further details, please visit the RES website or talk to one of the friendly staff who are around uh, or any of my fellow trustees to find out more, either here or uh, at the Verrill Supper uh, later. So the Royal Entomological Society strives to be a welcoming and growing community of entomologists, and we've seen over 40% increase in membership over the last two years. And we'd love to encourage you to spread the word to your colleagues, students and supervisors so we can continue to strengthen our voice as an organisation and to champion insect science in policy, education and through events and our publications. So talking of uh, publications, uh, I'd like to highlight our seven fantastic journals. And by publishing your research through the RES, you support the entomological community and the society's work as a charity and learned society. Um, and you can see uh, on the slide there are several more reasons that the RES journals are a great choice uh, for your next research paper. I'd also like to tell you about ENTO 24, which will be taking place at the University of Liverpool in September. We're expecting about 300 entomologists and a really exciting and engaging programme of talks and workshops. Registration and abstract submission will be opening soon, uh, so please check your inboxes and the RES uh, website. So... That brings me to introduce today's speaker and the RES Feral Lecturer for 2024, Professor Rebecca Kilner. Uh, Rebecca is an evolutionary biologist from the University of Cambridge. She's a fellow of Pembroke College and head of the university's Department of Zoology. Rebecca's research investigates how social behaviour evolves and how it then changes the course of evolution. And although she began her career by studying birds, she saw the light about 15 years ago when she realised that she could ask much more interesting evolutionary questions if she focused her work on insects. Her current research combines experimental evolution on laboratory populations of bearing beetles with field experiments and population genomics. Rebecca became the 1866 Professor of Zoology at Cambridge University in 2023. She was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 2021 and in 2010 received the Scientific Medal from the Zoological Society of London. And she's also an Honorary Fellow of the Royal Entomological Society. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Rebecca. Well, hello, 
there, everyone? Can you hear me okay? Yes, Fantastic. Uh, and I should start by thanking Jane for that very generous and kind introduction and the Royal Entomological Society for inviting me to speak to you this evening as your pre-prandial entertainment. Uh, it's a huge honour to be here, uh, particularly, as Jane said, because it's only rather late in life that I've come to appreciate the full glory of the insect world, especially compared with some of you who have been lifelong enthusiasts. So, as you all know, insects are exceptional in many ways, and some of them, those qualities make them superb study organisms for evolutionary biologists like me. And I'm especially interested in the connection between evolution and animal behavior. So this is a talk about the relationship between research in these two different fields and how we can use the remarkable his natural history of the Bering beetle to draw general conclusions that unite these two different areas of work. And so the story starts in the 1930s, because this is when the field of ethology, the scientific study of animal behavior in nature, first started to take shape. And it's also a time of great expansion in evolutionary thinking. And these different fields of research generated quite different ways of analyzing the connection between evolution and animal behavior. Now, the way that we think about the relationship between animal behavior and evolution now was set out by the fathers of ethology. So Nico, Nico Tinbergen and Conrad Lorenz, who in turn were inspired by Darwin. So here they're shown in increasing order of beardiness, Tinbergen, <laughs> Lorenz and Darwin. And like Darwin, Tinbergen and Lorenz were exceptional naturalists. And they're also adaptationists. So they're very keen on finding a purpose for the behaviors that they observed in nature. And in 1963, Tinbergen wrote a landmark paper that defined the field of ethology, which he dedicated to Lorenz on his 60th birthday. And in that paper, he set out two research questions for thinking specifically about the connection between evolution and behavior. So they ask, how is behavior adaptive? So in other words, how does behavior function to promote an animal's fitness? And they also ask, what is the evolutionary history of that behavior? So that means that they place the animal's actions at the end of an evolutionary sequence, and they see them as the adaptive outcome of evolution under natural selection. And by setting out these two research questions, Tim Bergen laid the foundations of a whole new field of research, now called behavioral ecology, which has grown and matured substantially in the last 60 years or so. But what I want to focus on today is a re relatively neglected way of thinking about the connection between evolution and behavior. Because while Tim Bergen and Lorenz were busy in Europe establishing the field of ethology, over in the States, this chap, George Gaylord Simpson, was asking his own questions. And Simpson is famous for being one of the architects of the modern synthesis. So that's this very fertile period of evolutionary thought in the 1930s and 40s that blended the genetical analysis of variation and inheritance with Darwinian ideas about natural selection and adaptation. Simpson was also a paleontologist, keen on the study of fossils. And so by the 1950s, he had already successfully introduced <coughs> concepts from the modern synthesis into paleontology, and now he turned his sights on doing the same for animal behavior. Now, as a paleontologist, Simpson took a long view of evolution. And so that meant he positioned behavior in the middle of an evolutionary sequence rather than at the end, as Tim Bergen and Lorenz had done. And so he asks, how does behavior evolve? But then, how does it determine the subsequent course of evolution? And it's this second part of his question that I refer to as Simpson's question. So here we've got two subtly different ways of thinking about the relationship between behavior and evolution. 
We've got ethologists who see behavior as the outcome of adaptive evolution. And we've got Simpson, who's thinking of behavior as an adaptation, but also dynamically contributes to further evolutionary change. And as it turns out, Simpson's question has largely been forgotten. And you can see this for, from this comparison of volumes from the Cambridge Zoology Library. So over on the left here, we have the volume bearing Tim Bergen's questions, which is battered and bruised, and the pages are falling out because they've been so extensively consulted by generations of students and academics. And over on the right here, we have the volume bearing Simpson's question, which you can see is pristine, immaculate, and largely untouched. And yet, I think it's Simpson's question that matters to us now. And so here we have a conventional description of the adaptive evolutionary process, in which we have ecological conditions imposing selection on variation that's inherited to bring about trait change through genetic change. And Simpson question asks, how does behavior affect each of the steps in this evolutionary sequence? And that matters now because answering Simpson's question helps us to predict how animals will evolve and adapt in a changing world and how their behavior is going to help them to do that. And I'm sure that you will also have noticed that these links are related to current hot button topics in evolutionary biology, which some people are now using to challenge the core concepts of the modern synthesis by developing a so-called extended synthesis. And they're using these topics to try and start a revolution in evolutionary thinking. But actually, from looking at the history, we can see that these are not extended questions. They're just neglected questions. They're linked to Simpson's question, and so they're rooted directly in the modern synthesis. We don't need a revolution to accommodate these ideas. They can fit very well into the conventional framework that we've been using since the 1950s to understand evolution. So what I want to do in the talk today is to show you some of the work that we've been doing that addresses Simpson's question by investigating how behavior influences evolution in each of these three different ways. Now, we can't possibly analyze the huge diversity of animal behavior in our single lab. And so we focus on one form of behavior in particular, and that's parental behavior. So if you want to study how parental behavior affects evolution, then ideally we want to study species that's locally abundant, that shows parental care, that breeds readily in the lab, but which has a sufficiently short generation time that we can carry out some experimental evolution so that we can see exactly how it is that behavior contributes to evolutionary change. Unfortunately, precisely such an animal exists in the shape of the Bering beetle. Now, the natural history of the Bering beetle was first made famous by the great French naturalist Jean-Henri Fabre. So here's the great man himself looking drained by the sheer magnificence <laughs> of his own prose. So here is what he had to say about the Bering beetle. The most vigorous and famous of these expurgators of the soil is the Bering beetle, so different from the cadaveric mob in dress and habits. For he is a grave digger, a sexton. He buries a corpse entire on the spot in a cellar where the thing duly ripened will form the diet of his larvae. He buries it in order to establish his progeny therein. He makes a clearance of death on behalf of life. So that's the peak of the talk. It's all downhill from now on. Uh, and here, in much more prosaic terms, is the life cycle that Fabra was describing. And so it starts in a, in a couple of months. The bearing beetles that have been overwintering in the soil will emerge, and they'll start to fly around seeking out the newly dead. So they're looking for a small vertebrate like a dead mouse or a dead songbird. And if they get lucky, they find a dead body. And if they get really lucky, then a partner will show up too. And then together, the pair will set about converting this corpse into a nest for their young. So they shave off the fur or feathers, they roll the flesh into a ball, and they bury it underground, all the while covering it in fluids from their mouth and their anus. 
So while they're busy doing that, the female lays her eggs in the soil surrounding the carcass. And after a couple of days, the eggs hatch and they crawl to the carcass and they take up residence on this <coughs> edible nest and they start to feed themselves. And then the parents will show up as well and continue to look after them and to feed them. And then within a week, there's nothing left of the dead body except for a few bones. And at that point, the parents fly off in search of more dead things, and the larvae crawl away into the soil to pupate. That takes about three weeks. Then they emerge as sexually immature adults. They stay like that for a couple more weeks, and then they become sexually mature, and the life cycle starts again. So here we have an animal that ticks all our boxes. It's locally abundant in the woods surrounding Cambridge. It displays relatively elaborate parental care and it has a short generation time, and so is ideal for testing how behavior influences evolution. And just before we get into the details of what we've been doing, I just want to show you a little bit more about our setup in the lab so you can understand what comes next. This is one of our study sites at Wick and Fen. We take beetles, we trap them, we bring them into the lab. Each beetle gets its own personal little box with a unique identity label on it. When we want to breed them, we put them in a slightly larger plastic box, lined with soil, furnished with a dead mouse, pop in a pair of beetles, put the lid on, put it in a cupboard for a week, and we come back a week later and we can count and weigh and measure the larvae. And so with this setup, we can manipulate the details of the environment during each breeding event to impose selection at each generation if we want to, and we can easily track the effects down the generations. And we can also process a large number of individuals, which means we can carry out large-scale evolutionary experiments. So we're going to start off then by thinking about how behavior changes ecological conditions. Now, for this part of the talk, we're going to focus on events that go on before hatching, during carcass preparation, and the conversion of the dead body into a nest. And the work that I'm going to describe here was led by these two fabulous members of my lab, Anna Duarte, and Sion Jun Sun. So bearing beetles depend on finding a dead body to breed upon, but they are not the only ones that need this resource. And that means there's intense competition for carrion, and one source of carrion are the many microbes that live in the soil surrounding the dead body or on the dead body itself, who like to use the resources on the body for their own reproduction. And we can get a sense of the scale of microbial competition by seeing what happens to a carcass that doesn't get detected by burying beetles in the hours after its death. And it turns out there's a surprisingly large amount of footage describing this in great detail on YouTube, and that's where I've taken this footage from here. So here we go. Here's our dead body. And what you can see immediately from this time-lapse footage is the first thing that happens is the abdomen inflates. And that's because the microbes in the dead mouse's gut are now starting pr to proliferate like mad and producing a lot of gas. And eventually, the, the pressure within the body is so great that the body wall ruptures. Here we go. Fluids seep out. And that triggers the colonization of the carcass by many different microbial communities. And you can see that illustrated by the spread of fungal mycelium all over the dead body but there are all sorts of other microbes that are starting to use this body to breed upon themselves. And so that means that if the beetle wants to use the dead body to breed upon itself, it's got to somehow deal with this threat of microbial competition. Now, beetles also face competition from other insects that would like to use the dead body to breed on, like blowflies, which are very quick to locate the newly dead and to lay their eggs upon it. And so what we're going to do now is to look at how beetles deal with competition from microbes and from blowflies by managing the ecological conditions on the carcass to their advantage. And they've got two techniques for doing this. And the first one centers on the way that they convert a dead body into a nest for their larvae. So to see how they do that, we're going to look at time-lapse footage of how nest preparation occurs. So we're looking at two days' work condensed into 30 seconds. It's filmed under infrared light, so there's minimal gore. It's in black and white. Don't worry about that. And let's see exactly how they go about doing this. 
So the first thing the beetles do is they move the body around a bit, and then they home in on the abdomen, they make an incision, and they pull out the guts, and they eat them. And then they start shaving off the fur. You can see that's this white stuff accumulating on the surface of the soil. And then when the body is naked, they start to roll it into a ball. And if we'd given them enough soil, the body would be below ground by now. And so you can see that by the time we get to the end of this two-day period, what we end up with is this beautiful sphere of flesh glinting slightly in the light because of all the fluids that the beetles have added to it. So there are four actions that matter here for coping with the competition for carrion. And they are the removal of the guts, because that prevents rupture and the colonization of the carcass by microbes. Carcass burial, because that obviously hides the carcass from rivals. The balling up of the carcass, and we'll see why that matters in a moment. And the smearing of exudates all over the surface of the flesh. So I know you want to see those exudates in close-up detail, so it's your lucky day. Here they are. Those are the anal exudates of the bearing beetle, ladies and gentlemen. And it turns out that they play a key role in managing competition with microbes. And we've shown in several different ways that these exudates destroy bacterial cells and that these antibacterial properties are correlated with the expression of a single gene. It's called lysozyme 6, although many other genes are involved as well. And we've also discovered that the exudates restructure the microbiome on the carcass nest, partly by eliminating the bacteria that are likely to be pathogenic to the beetle and its larvae. Now, we investigated whether the microbiome on the dead body is actually adaptive from the beetle's perspective. So do they need it to reproduce successfully? Or, in an ideal world, would they prefer not to have any microbes on the dead body at all? And to answer that question, we took advantage of the fact that germ-free mice have been bred by biomedical scientists who are interested in understanding the function of gut microbes. So these are mice that have not been exposed to microbes at all at any point in their lives, either in their external environment or within their dead bodies, their, sorry, their living bodies. So we got hold of these dead germ-free mice, and we had some control mice that were replete with microbes. And then we chopped them in half so that we could isolate the tail end and the uh, head end, and so look at the effects of the gut microbes in particular, and then we presented them to bearing beetles who bred on them in regular soil. And we compared the performance of pairs in those two different conditions by looking at larval mass at dispersal, because this is a, a well-known predictor of fitness in bearing beetles. It predicts adult survival and fecundity. So here are the results of that experiment. So over on the left here is the entire data set. Please don't be dismayed by the small sample size, because each dead germ-free mouse cost 150 pounds, so we were quite limited in our ability to expand the sample size. Uh, anyway, it's the entire data set, so the blue filled circles show the control head data, the open blue circles show the control tail data, the red filled circles show the germ-free head, and the red open circles the germ-free tail. And the first thing we looked at is the relationship between larval mass and the number of larvae on the carcass. And this is, shows, unremarkably, a negative relationship. And we find this every single time we breed beetles on a carrion nest. It simply means that there are limited resources. So if there are more larvae, there are fewer resources per head to go around, and larvae are smaller by the time they finish developing. So if we want to know what effect the carcass has on beetle development, we have to control for this very strong effect. And that's what we've done here over on the right by looking at the deviations from that regression line shown on the left. And when we look at the data in this way, then you can see that there is indeed an effect of the carcass on beetle performance, and that larvae are heavier when they develop on a nest with microbes than on a nest that's made from a germ-free mouse. And what's more, the consequences of breeding on a germ-free mouse are especially negative when beetles be breed on the tail end rather than the head end. So all this suggests that beetles really do need 
the gut microbes from the dead mouse to breed successfully because their larvae are particularly weedy when they develop without them. So what we've seen then is that the beetles actively restructure the bacterial community on the carcass using those exudates, but they don't eliminate it completely, probably because the mouse's gut microbes actually could help promote beetle reproductive success. And we don't know yet how that works, so it might be that the microbes are providing direct assistance with carcass digestion, for example, or it might be that they're just a cue that induces better care uh, from the parents. But whatever the mechanism, the beetles need those gut microbes because when we remove them experimentally, the beetles produce smaller larvae. So that's the first way in which beetles change ecological conditions on their carcass to deal with competition. What we're going to do now is to look at a second way. And that's how they manage the competition with blowflies. Now it turns out that this involves the beetles' relationship with these mites, which are specialist on burying beetles. And they're called Poisilochiris carabi. So if you catch a burying beetle in nature, it's very likely that you'll see it covered in these mites. And just like burying beetles, mites like to breed on dead things. But unlike burying beetles, they lack the capacity to find a corpse because they can't fly. And so what they do is they use the beetle like a private jumbo jet for traveling between breeding opportunities. So they cling on to the beetle's exoskeleton with special adaptations, and they hitch a ride as the beetle flies around, seeking out the dead. And if they, as soon as the beetle finds a corpse, the mites hop off, and they breed alongside the beetle on uh, the dead body. So they molt quickly into the adult form, they reproduce, and their life cycle is timed to match the duration of beetle parental care. So that means that the next generation of mites is ready to hop on to the parents as they fly off at the end of the breeding bout. And so each beetle flying off carries somewhere, 70% of them have between 1 and 20 mites upon them. Now it's long been speculated that mites help beetles outcompete blowflies because they eat any blowfly eggs that they find on the carrion. But nobody had really put that to the test in field conditions until Sun did at one of our study sites in Maddingley Woods. And so what he did was he set up pairs of beetles to breed uh, and a dead mouse at each of these locations marked with a yellow spot. And each location was used repeatedly throughout the breeding season from May to September. And he removed all the naturally occurring mites from the pair as he set them up to breed. And then he put back mites in three different treatments. So either he put back no mites at all, or he gave them 10 mites, or he gave them 20 mites. And then he recorded the natural temperature at each breeding event. And just naturally, each breeding event was exposed to attack by blowflies. And at the end of reproduction, he exhumed the dead body, and he measured both beetle and blowfly reproductive success by counting the number of larvae produced by both species. So the results of that experiment are shown here, and we're going to start off by looking at the reproductive success of each species when there are no mites present at all. So over on the left, we're doing that for burying beetles. We've got the natural temperature gradient on the x-axis and the number of larvae that they produce on the y-axis. And you can see that's a hump-shaped curve, so they have peak reproductive success at an intermediate temperature. Over on the right, we've got the corresponding data for blowflies, and you can see it's the inverse. So they perform least well at the intermediate temperatures and much better at lower and higher temperatures. So that suggests that the blowflies and the beetles are in competition on carrion and that the burying beetles win that competition at intermediate temperatures, but the blowflies are winning at lower and higher temperatures. So the next question to ask is, why is it that the beetles are struggling so much at these lower and higher temperatures? And part of the answer seems to be linked to how effectively the beetles prepare their carrier nest. 
So this is where we come back to the idea of roundness that I was talking about a minute ago. We can quantify how roundly the nest is prepared by comparing it to the sphericity of a ping pong ball. And that's what this axis on the, on the left here shows you. And you can see that at lower temperatures, the spher sphericity of the nest falls quite some way below perfect sphericity and certainly below that achieved at intermediate and higher temperatures. And it turns out that this is correlated with the performance of blowfly larvae. So when beetles make a less round nest, the blowfly larvae do really well. And that might be because the beetles are just generally off their carrion preparation game at lower temperatures, or it might be linked specifically to roundness itself. We don't yet know. So that explains why they're so <coughs> coping so poorly at lower temperatures. What about at higher temperatures? Well, the reason that blowflies do better here is simply that they develop more rapidly than beetles do at higher temperatures. And you can see that from these data shown here, which simply replicate what many other labs have already shown before us. So we've got the different developmental stages of blowfly marching through on the, on the lower axis here. And you can see that each of those stages, the shorter time spent in them at higher temperatures than at lower temperatures. And we don't see a corresponding acceleration for bearing beetle development. So blowflies have a developmental advantage at higher temperatures, and that allows them to gain the competitive upper hand. So the beetle needs help at lower and higher temperatures to cope with the threat of blowflies. And this is where the mites come in. And you can see that from the data shown here. So now we're comparing beetle reproductive success when they're breeding alongside no mites, 10 mites, and 20 mites. And you can see that with 10 mites and their performance at lower temperatures is enhanced. And with 20 mites, their performance at higher temperatures is enhanced as well. <coughs> so the mites are acting as part-time allies for the beetle in seeing off rival blowflies. And this alliance seems to be especially important to the beetle at lower and higher temperatures. And you can only imagine that this alliance is going to become even more important for beetles in the future as our climate continues to change. So the overall grand conclusion from this first part of the talk then is that beetles evade or manage competition for carrion by managing the ecological conditions on the nest. They hide carrion from rivals by balling it up and burying it. They manage microbial competition by preventing rupture and modifying the carcass bi microbiome. And they carry mites as a facultative ally against blowflies. And what I want to do now is to move on and to consider how behavior can be an agent of selection. And the work that I'm going to describe here was started by Ben Jarrett and Matt Schroeder, shown here. And for this part of the talk, we're going to turn to events after hatching. So I thought I'd set the scene with some home movie of Bering Beetle family life. So what we're looking at here is the nest. That's the mouse as was. And you can see the larvae all snuggled up within. And what happens is that most of the time, the larvae busy themselves by munching away on the carcass. But from time to time, a parent shows up, seeks out individual larvae, makes contact mouth part to mouth part, and transfers fluids directly into the mouths of their young. Now, the bearing beetle is often described as a beetle with bioparental care because of remarkable acts of behavior like this. But in fact, it turns out that there's huge variation from one family to the next in the amount of care that's supplied. So at one extreme, we have parents that are extremely dutiful, that look after their offspring throughout the whole period of larval development, as this parent is doing here. And at the other extreme, much, much rarer, but it does happen, we have parents that make the carrion nest, but then fly off. And so leave their larvae to fend for themselves on the carcass. And the larvae can survive under these conditions, at least in the lab. So we exploited this quirk of Bering Beetle natural history to investigate 
how parental care influences natural selection. And the design of our experiment captured these extremes in, in the provision of care, and it's shown here. So we got some wild-caught individuals, we brought them to the lab, and we put some aside as a baseline population for comparison with what came next. And the rest we cast into experimental evolution. And we had two different kinds of treatments, each replicated twice. So in our full care lines, the parents were allowed to stay with their young throughout the whole period of development. But in our no care lines, we allowed the parents to prepare the carrier nest. But as soon as that was finished, and before the larvae had hatched, we whipped them out. So parents never met their offspring in the no care lines. And then we did that for generation after generation after generation. And after six generations, we were beside ourselves with excitement. This is about a year into the experiment. And we were desperate to know whether we could find any evidence that the populations had adapted to these different regimes of parental care. And so to test that possibility, we put all the populations through a common garden environment for one generation. So they all experienced full care to eliminate any residual maternal effects. And then we could be more confident that any changes that we had found <clears throat> could be attributable to genetic change and therefore evolutionary change. And then we took individuals from the full care lines and we exposed them either to full care or no care for one generation. And we did the same with individuals from the no care lines. So they too got full care or no care <clears throat> for one generation. And we predicted that if the populations had indeed adapted to their new regime of care, then we should see that beetles from the full care populations should outperform individuals from the no care populations in the full care environment. But the reverse would be true for the no care environment. Here, we should see individuals from the no care lines outperforming those from the full care lines. And <clears throat> pleasingly, that's exactly what we found. And you can see that from these data here. So on the horizontal axis, we have the care levels provided in the experiment no care or full care, so that's just for one generation. And on the vertical axis, we have a measure of breeding success, and the blue lines depict whether individuals came from the full care line, whereas the green lines correspond to individuals from the no care lines. And you can see, sure enough, the individuals from the no care lines outperformed those from the full care lines in the no care environment, but the reverse was true in the full care environment. And so as clear evidence for social selection by parents because individuals in the different lines have somehow adapted to these different regimes of care. So what we wanted to do next was obviously try and figure out exactly what had changed in these different populations, what traits had changed. And we did that through the generations by carrying out subsequent uh, experiments. And the first thing we did was to look at the no-care larvae. And here we found two different kinds of adaptation in particular. The first was an adaptation that's probably connected with being more self-sufficient in the absence of parental care. Because what we found remarkably was that in these populations, the no-care larvae evolved to have larger mandibles than in the full-care populations. And the mandibles are key to fitness for larvae growing up without parents. And that's because they have to bite their own way into the carcass and to feed themselves. So perhaps it's not surprising that these traits have enlarged in the populations exposed to no parental care. But we also found not only evidence of greater self-sufficiency, but greater evidence of cooperation among larvae. So they helped each other when the parents weren't there to help them. And this evolved in the absence of care, possibly as a consequence of a change in the proteins in the secretions of the larvae as they developed on the carcass. And that's a line of research that's still underway. So that's what happened in the larvae, but we also found changes in the parents. And one of the most prominent changes we found was in the speed and effic efficacy of their production of the carrier nest. And that's denoted by the presence of an incision. That's the very final act of carcass preparation, parents bite a tiny little hole so that larvae are able to conquer the carcass and take up residence on the nest. And what we're seeing with these data is the proportion of nests that bear an incision 
53 hours after pairing because that's when we took the parents out. So we're comparing the wild types and the full cares. Here you can see around about a third have got around to putting an incision in uh, 53 hours after hatching. But that more than doubles in the no-care populations. And so they have evolved to front load their parental care in compensation for the fact that they can no longer provide any post-hatching care. Because these changes in carcass preparation we showed in separate experiments have an impact on larval fitness. Now we know from other work that although both beetles prepare the nest together, and you saw that from that film earlier, it's actually males that take the lead. So we wondered whether the adaptation to prepare the nest more rapidly was due simply to exposure to the no-care treatment, or whether males and females are, have adapted their nest preparation behavior to each other. And so to test that idea, we set up males and females in four different combinations. So we had no-care males that were paired either with full-care or no-care females, and we also had full-care um, males that were paired with either no-care or full-care females. And then we simply measured how many pairs had completed nest preparation within 53 hours after pairing using this incision as our marker of nest completion. And the results of that experiment are shown here. So if you compare across columns, then you can see the results for the males. And what you can see is that the no cares, no care males, have indeed sped up their carrion nest preparation behavior. And that's true whether they're paired with a no care female or a full care female. But if we look along the lines, we can assess female performance. And by doing that, you can see that no care females perform much better when they're paired with no care males than when they're prepared, um, paired with full care males. And that full care males perform better with a full care female than with a no care female. So if we take those results together, what we can conclude is that the no care environment selects for the pair jointly to prepare the nest more rapidly, and that the selection has acted on males unilaterally to speed up their nest preparation behavior, but the females then adapt their behavior to suit the male that they're paired with. So the grand conclusion from all this work is that parental care creates a benign world in which offspring can grow and develop. And when we removed parental care, we exposed offspring to a much harsher, wider world. And offspring adapted by becoming more self-sufficient and by cooperating more with each other. And parents adapted by targeting their care more effectively to promote offspring fitness. And in the final part of the talk, I want briefly to present some preliminary data showing you how the benign environment created by parental care can also modulate the extent of genetic variation in a population. And this is work that was begun by former postdoc Sonia Pasquale and developed by Rahia Masood, who's now a research fellow at UCL. So the idea here is that mutations spontaneously arise at each generation as a result of errors during DNA replication. And the majority of these mutations have only a mildly negative effect on the offspring produced. So they're only slightly less good than the normal wild type individuals. And behavior matters here because behavior influences whether these mildly deleterious mutations are, pur are purged out of the population or whether they persist. And it does that by influencing the actions of natural selection. So in the harsh environment experienced by the no-care populations, for example, we'd expect mutations to be strongly selected against. But in the more benign environment, in the full-care populations, selection is likely to be more relaxed and mutations can persist. And we can test this idea by measuring the mutation load carried by each type of experimental population by inbreeding individuals taken from those different lines. And we'd expect inbreeding to cause rapid extinction in the full care populations, 
if the mutation load is high, as predicted by this idea, but that the extinction rate should be much lower in the no-care populations that carry a lower mutation load. So the results of an experiment just like that are shown here. So after 20 generations of experimental evolution, we took individuals from the evolving populations and we used them to seed new populations that we then inbred for generation after generation until they went extinct. And then we measured the probability of lineage survival in each case. And that's what these lines here show. And so what you can see is that the probability of lineage survival falls off more steeply in the full care populations than it does in the no care populations. And that's exactly what we would expect if the full care populations are carrying a greater mutation load. So this suggests that by creating a benign environment in which their offspring develop, parents are relaxing the effects of natural selection and they're allowing mutations to persist. And in this way, they're potentially increasing genetic variation in the population. Now, we're here subsequently ran some whole genome sequencing of the evolving lines to actually see whether we could detect differences in the extent of genetic variation in each population. And you can see from these data here that sure enough, she found greater genetic variation in the full care lines than in the no care lines in support of our results from the inbreeding experiment. So that's shown here on the right. Here we've got the two different kinds of populations and the two replicate lines, one and two, shown here. And this measure on the vertical axis, it's called Watterson's theta, is a measure of the extent of genetic variation in the genome. And you can see that for each replicate line, it's greater in the full care populations than in the no care populations. So meanwhile, back at our measures of mutation load, so remember we've got this difference in mutation load between the no cares and the full cares. Now it turns out that we were only able to detect this difference when we allowed larvae to develop without any parental care. When they had parental care, we couldn't find any difference between the lines at all, even though that mutation load existed. So we conclude from this work that care causes genetic variation to accumulate, including mildly deleterious mutations. But parental care is also the antidote to a greater mutation load. And so I think this offers a new explanation for the evolution of parental care. Because perhaps care becomes self-reinforcing because it creates a problem that only care can solve. And that might explain why it is that we see parental care has evolved on many more times across the animal kingdom than, has it, than it's been lost. So once care evolves, it creates a problem for which it is the only cure, and so it causes populations to become locked in to providing care in order to persist. And these are ideas that we want to pursue in our future work. But meanwhile, we've come to the end of the presentation. So what I've shown you is three different answers to Simpson's question. I've shown you how behavior can structure ecological conditions. I've shown you how behavior can be an agent of selection. But I've also shown you that behavior can relax selection to the extent that it allows genetic variation to accumulate in some populations. <laughs> and more generally, we've seen that addressing Simpson's question offers new evolutionary insights into animal behavior that we don't get from the traditional perspective, such as the possibility that care persists because it's genetically self-reinforcing. And we've also seen that Simpson's question gives us the insight, gives us insight into the resilience of wild populations experiencing climate change. And we saw that the beetles alliance with mites becomes more valuable as temperatures rise or fall, for example. So I'd like to see Simpson's question at the heart of more research into animal behavior and evolution because it generates novel insights into how evolution works and it speaks to some of the big <laughs> biological problems of our time. But I'd also like to see the amazing natural history of the Bering beetle known more widely. It's surely one of the most charismatic insects we have in Britain, but unless you like hanging out in woods at night or hanging around around dead things, the chances are you're never going to see one. 
So you've probably all got a, a favorite insect of your own that you'd like to champion, so I should probably stop there before I alienate you all. <laughs> but I'd just like to thank you all for listening so carefully and these wonderful people and organizations for sustaining our work over the years. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for a lovely talk. I have a non-insect themed question, okay, actually great. more around the bacteria. <laughs> oh God, okay. <laughs> I do apologize. Do you happen to have any ideas or any samples maintained from the history of your selection experiment on the bacterial colony? So I'm curious as to whether there's a change in the composition of the parasitic, mutualistic, and commensal bacteria. Yes. Yes, so uh, the answer to that question is yes. We have uh, a paper in preparation about that at the moment. I wish there was a clear-cut, clean answer that I could give you, but there isn't, on uh, relating to either of those three classes of the bacteria uh, on the carrion. Uh, the short answer is that there are, are some changes, but we don't really understand why. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but does that answer your question as much detail as I can anyway? Thank you. That's lovely to okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you also for the talk. So I just had a point of clarification I wanted to ask. So on the bit where you mentioned the um, gut bacteria cause the corpse to um, sort of swell up and then burst, and the beetle wants to avoid this by taking the guts out of the mouse, uh, what's the difference between sort of the swelling and bursting and what the beetle does? Because surely in both cases, you're, the beetle still has to pierce the body of the mouse, which will open up to the environment and microbes in order to drag the guts out. So fill this in detail I've accidentally missed. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's a good question. So the beetles consume all the guts, and that includes all the microbes within them, and then they kind of recycle those microbes through their own digestive system and back out through those lovely anal exudates, and then that p contributes to the change in the carcass microbiome. So the, if you're very interested in all the details, then look at Duarte et al. 2018 in the Journal of Animal Ecology, because there you can see exactly which members of the carcass microbiome are changed as a consequence of the beetle's actions versus us burying the carcass versus just leaving the carcass sat there. So you can, we can disentangle the various contributions of those processes to the change in microbiome. And I think that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, g g g given the, sorry, excellent talks before I say anything else. You don't um, have to say that every time, it's fine. <laughs> no, but it was really good. Um, g g g g given there's a difference between males and females sometimes in parental care, is there any evidence from the wild whether the mites preferentially bind to males or females? That, that's a very nice question. So we, yes, and I wonder, so act, let me rewind. So the, in general... The males leave before the females do. So the females are left caring for the larvae for longer. And I wonder whether part of that is because they're just nipping off before the, the mites are ready to leap onto them. So they don't have to carry such a huge burden to the next breeding attempt. Um, so we haven't been able to detect any differences in the mite load carried by like, drilling down to sex differences. And part of that is to do with the way that we trap beetles in nature. So we suspend a Japanese beetle trap. It's got soil and a mouse in it. We put it up for a week, and then we come back and we collect everything within. And by that point, the beetles have been in there for a bit, and any mites that are on them have kind of mingled between them. And so I wouldn't be confident enough to say that the loads that we detect at that point are reflective of what they were when the beetles arrived. So we have to refine our trapping technique to actually drill down and answer your question more precisely. But my prediction would be 
that the, the males have fewer mites than females because they've left before the mites can hop on. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, that was a super body of work, and thanks for, for presenting it. Um, I'm interested in your final um, sort of message about the sort of self-reinforcing effect of parental care. Um, so it, j just to sort of recap, get, get this straight in my head, um, there's the suggestion that um, parental care can pot potentially reduce f sort of genomic fitness, um, but it somehow um, sort of compensates for that. And earlier on, you showed a video where uh, an adult was seemed to be preferentially picking out and feeding uh, one of the larvae. And I, I just wondered if there's any evidence that they are selecting the fittest larvae and feeding those. And that's possibly one of the mechanisms, behavioral mechanisms for that self-reinforcement. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a great suggestion, and we haven't been able to test that idea because we're limited in our ability to identify individual larvae. So we've tried all sorts of different ways to mark individuals, and we can't do it in a way that sustains for any period of time so that we could see whether that was happening. We'd need to mark individuals to see who parents are feeding. The only way we can do it is by chopping off legs, and that's not very helpful for observations made from videos like that. We can't count all the eight, the eight legs. They're not visible every time. So, um, yeah, I, that's a brilliant suggestion. I'd love to be able to test it. I just haven't got the techniques available yet to be able to do that. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. This question is more practical uh, rather than on selection. And the question is, do, does Necrophorus uh, change its technique depending on whether the, the corpse is feathered or furred. Um, I Why think I asked this is a few years ago, I was coming home and saw what was clearly a dead sparrow at the side of the um, drive, and it was moving. Uh -huh. Realising that dead sparrows don't often fly, <laughs> uh, I thought this merits further look, and there was a pair of necrophorus on the corpse, and they were burying it, and it wasn't stripped. Oh, okay, interesting. And I watched it and bury it, and it was entire with feathers. And I watched it till dusk. Wow. And the next day, I looked at where they buried it, and there was no sign of feathers or down on the surface. So do they strip feathered corpses underground and furred corpses on the surface? Um, that, so that's very interesting. So we have... Um, we have colleagues that have collected dead great tip chicks for us to be able to look at um, burying beetles and how they treat uh, birds in the lab. We, we were interested in for other reasons besides whether or not they munch off the feathers. But we found that they did remove the feathers, and, but we haven't done it in the wild. So in the lab, we don't have enough soil for them to properly bury the whole thing. So in combination with your observations, maybe they do just remove the feathers once they've got underground somehow. But they did, in our lab populations, they did continue to remove the feathers uh, in the ways that they removed the fur with the, the mouse um, corpses. So, yeah, so, that, so perhaps they just do it at a different stage. That's really interesting. Thank you for telling me about that. You just hold it here. Yeah, uh, my, my question is just about um, competition for the corpses so with the beetles. Would you have multiple beetles competing for the same corpse? And do the ones that don't have parental care that have the larger mandibles, for example, are they more likely to win over that corpse because they've got larger mandibles or things like that? Yeah, OK, so I've glossed over all that because it's a layer of complexity that yeah. we could do without. But anyway, well, let's go there now. <laughs> so... Um, so at a typical mouse, you might get, say, four or five beetles showing up, and then there's a competition for who gets to own it. And the competition's organised within each sex. So the males fight each other, the females fight each other, and the winner of each of those competitions then pairs up, and they become the dominant pair that owns the nest. And the losers either fly off and try and find more carrion themselves, or if they're a male, they hang around and they try and sneak matings with the dominant female... And if they're a female, they might become a brood parasite and try and sneak their egg into the clutch of the dominant female. 
Uh, I've forgotten what the second part of your question was. That's right. So, so head, it turns out that uh, in the adults, it's head size that matters for predicting success in fighting. So individuals with broader heads, presumably with greater jaw musculature occupying those wider heads, they're better able to see off rivals. And that's actually a better predictor than body size per se in winning a fight. Yes, fantastic talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, I hope I didn't miss this, but the, all the little families you were following through, they were natural families. And they were founded by, primarily by one pair, even though they may have had, in the wild, a few things sneaked in in addition. I was just wondering, is it possible to create little groups of larvae, which, each of which comes from a different parental source, and if you do that, do you see any difference in the amount of cooperation? I'm thinking about a sort of test of kin selection in a sure. way, because some people are more impressed by the importance of cooperation per se, uh, rather than explaining everything through kin selection. And it looks like your system is perfect for looking at that sort of issue. Uh, indeed, and it has been used to address precisely that question. Uh, so there's no evidence that beetles can recognise kin directly. That's the first thing to say. But they, if a, so if you have two females breeding alongside each other on the carrion, so an incidence of inter, intraspecific brood parasitism, for example, the dominant female tries to prevent the subordinate from laying her eggs for as long as possible. So then the subordinate's eggs all hatch later than the dominant female's own offspring. <coughs> And just by virtue of timing, she can identify which are her offspring and which are not. But she can't do it by any other cue. So she's using that as her measure of relatedness to the offspring. There are other species of bearing beetle that breed on much larger dead things. And there, it's more typical to see incidences of communal breeding. So you see totally unrelated pairs or other combinations sharing the dead body and ra raising larvae alongside each other on the body because there's just enough to go around. So, so there you don't need to have any kind of kin selection to get communal breeding. I don't know, I, ha I haven't uh, I ha worked on the species like that myself and I don't think the people that have worked on them have been able to tell whether individuals in that situation can isolate their own offspring and preferentially look after them in comparison with the others. But where there is evidence uh, from the species that I work on it would suggest they can't do that. There are no cues available to enable them to do that. But maybe that's not the case in this other species. Sorry, but I make it a good one then. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, um, first of all, amazing, thank you. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering about the role of like the strategic infanticide that um, sort of happens with a lot of burying beetles, um, whether that was something that you were able to kind of take into account when you were looking at the differences between the care and non-care populations and, um, yeah, the, the effect that that might kind of have been having. Oh, sorry, I missed what you said. Oh, the, sorry, was the, I not holding the first bit, the, the, what was the trait that we're interested in? Um, strategic infanticide. Okay, I thought that's what you said. Yes. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, so there's this very unpleasant side to parental care in beetles, which is that adults like to eat a few of their own offspring. Uh, and so we, we looked at that in relation to um, clutch size, actually. So the, the beetles are very good at matching the resources on the carcass to the, the amount of offspring that they produce. And they do that in the t sort of two-stage process, typically in nature. They're very good at uh, laying a clutch that's approximately appropriate for the size of the dead thing that they're breeding on. If they get that slightly wrong, they have a second stab by eating the extras. And so we were interested to see, if we, because we accidentally took away that correcting mechanism after hatching, what that would mean for the precision of clutch size in the first stage. And actually what we found was that in the no-care populations, it increased the accuracy of their ability to match their clutch size to the carrion nest because they no longer had this correcting mechanism available to them at the second stage. Okay. That's 
Uh, great. Thank you um, ever so much, Rebecca, and uh, so many great questions as well and an absolutely fabulous talk. So it gives me great pleasure. Sorry, I don't have enough hands for this. It gives me great pleasure <laughs> to award you with the President's Medal and thank you ever so much thank for your you. talk. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, and uh, look forward to continuing these great uh, conversations and discussions for those of you who are going on now to the Beryl Supper. So look forward to talking to you then. Thank you.